is a new format uh, for the Skull Forum insofar as I'm afraid we're going to put you all to work. So if you're hoping that you can sit back and relax and be bathed in fountains of wisdom and not doing anything, you're sorely, sorely mistaken. Uh, because what we're here to do is to extract all your pearls of wisdom and for, uh, to, for, for us to leave uh, this room um, emboldened with your uh, wisdom and advice. Um, first of all, please silence your phones. That would be uh, most appreciated. Um, we're going to obviously uh, be taking interventions and contributions from the floor. Um, there'll be microphones that come round. If you could just wait before you speak uh, a couple of seconds and um, ensure that you're speaking into the microphone, that would be brilliant because otherwise your uh, contributions won't be picked up uh, on the tape. Um, and then after the session, if you could please take time to just fill out the uh, session survey and hand it to a steward on your way out of the door, that would be much appreciated. Um, so just to um, start off by s introducing us, um, we're uh, three individuals who've known each other in one way or another for uh, quite a long time, and you'll hear more about that in a minute. Uh, my name's Gemma Mortensen, uh, this is Kim Dixon, this is Brendan Cox, um, and we're here today to workshop something with you. So this is um, an initiative which is uh, in relatively early stages, um, and it is about an issue, as, as the title of the suggestion, su session suggests, which is very, very pertinent to the theme of the forum. Um, what the initiative that uh, we're uh, starting seeks to do is to understand the root causes of populism, of xenophobia and of social division, um, and to really look at um, what are the concrete initiatives that we can uh, bring forth that combine cutting edge research and analysis um, involving experts across the political spectrum um, with interventions that both help shape concretely public narratives um, around uh, otherness um, and around people's experiences of each other, um, as well as uh, helping to shift um, the kind of public narratives and giving people concrete experiences at the community level of different kinds of people. Um, so it sounds very simple, um, but overall, you know, what we're trying to do is, is a t yeah, it's a two-tiered thing, which is, uh, which a two-tiered thing, which is, um, to both sh help shape a public narrative um, in a way that is different um, to that which uh, prevails at the moment. And we'll talk a bit about that, like what we think that is and the research that we've done to understand what's happening. And then also um, to really look at um, what are the kinds of experiences that people can have at the community level concretely that help give people a sense that there are uh, ways uh, of, of tackling the problem of populism and xenophobia that um, we're not seeing and not accessing at the moment. And what we're really hoping to get out of today is some really practical insights and contributions from all of you um, to help us think through how we're going to do it. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to give you um, some insights into research that's been done uh, over the past year uh, that Tim's going to take us through. Um, and then we're going to hear a bit more um, about some of the prototypes, some of the experimentation that's already started happening um, to give you an idea of where we're headed. Um, and then we're going to um, give you the space to work in groups to uh, workshop through um, some of the strategy that we're looking at and come back to us with uh, some suggestions. Um, so maybe just to start off, um, in, all, in terms of just like where, we, where we're coming from with all this, Tim, do you want to kick off in terms of the, some of the background. Yeah, so it, it's probably useful just to, in, in terms of a little bit of our, our, our personal backgrounds. Um, this initiative began uh, 18 months ago in conversations between Brendan and me, who've known each other for several years, um, uh, at the middle of that big moment after the summer of uh, 2015, the Alan Curdy photograph, the, the boy who had drowned on the beach in, in Turkey, um, and our sense of this huge wave, wave of um, refugees coming into uh, the Europe and the anxiety that that was sparking um, uh, in populations across Europe, alongside the big welcome moment that happened as well. Um, I think for, for me, it sort of brought together, you know, in part heart, in part head and in part uh, conscience that I really wanted to work on this issue. Um, from my heart, uh, I had worked, uh, in fact, with Gemma two years before um, in establishing an organisation called the Syria Campaign, which uh, has done a lot of work behind the, the white helmets, if you've come across the Syrian uh, white helmets. That was an initiative to elevate the voices of Syrian civil society, moderate democratic voices, but also gave me a lot of exposure to the absolutely catastrophic suffering of Syrians. And so seeing the way in which 
European countries were responding at that moment made me, um, from the heart perspective, really aware that I felt I should do something. From the head perspective, um, uh, I have a background in sort of strategic comms and campaigning and so forth, uh, and it, I was acutely conscious of how important public opinion was going to become in the way in which the uh, countries of Europe and the world responded to this moment of crisis when we had a, a refugee crisis uh, on a level unparalleled since the Second World War. So I was conscious that we needed to have a sophisticated response, that there were many good actors of, in governments of all stripes who wanted to respond in a positive and humane way, but felt constrained by the uh, support or opposition um, from their own populations. And I felt with my head that we really needed to um, get better research, think in sophisticated ways about the narratives that are going to be effective, and prepare people for what's going to be uh, you know, a rough ride. With my conscience, I had spent several years in government in Australia. I was a Prime Minister's speechwriter, economic advisor for several years. And I had seen a government that began with all good intent on the issue of asylum seekers, some of the world's most vulnerable people. I had seen what happens when you respond to the rise of xenophobic populism by trying to appease it and by, by having short-term solutions to where you think, well, if we go sort of halfway and we cede this much territory, um, then we can uh, neutralise the power of that sort of xenophobic argument. Instead, what we did was we went halfway and they said, you've got to come halfway. And then we go halfway again. And then they say, you've got to come halfway. And you realise after a while that you just adopt incredibly cruel and inhumane policies to the extent where in Australia they ended up excising Australia's mainland from its migration zone, which is to say that if you arrive on the Australian mainland, you're actually not arriving in the migration zone of Australia. Why? Because successively there has been this approach of appeasing the, the populist xenophobic sentiment rather than taking it on. But I also know from my experience of government why that doesn't happen, because it's difficult. It re requires some really long-term strategic thinking about how you build a narrative that brings people in and doesn't feel like a narrative that only comes from the cosmopolitan, liberal sort of part of the population. So for those reasons, from sort of head, heart and conscience, um, I felt there was something uh, really important to be done here that would affect the welfare of some of the world's most vulnerable people. And that's where the conversation with, uh, that, that Brendan and I started uh, 18 months ago. Brendan. Um, uh, so so then, then from my end, um, I started as a 17-year-old scout. Uh, that's a very strange introduction. Um, uh, when I went to, uh, to Bosnia at the end of, uh, just as the conflict ended, so 96, 97. And I went uh, to work with a group of children from Sarajevo who had lost their parents. Um, uh, and and that, at that age, I think at any age would have been a fairly important experience, but that age was entirely formative for me in terms of what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I went on and worked there on and off uh, for about 12 years, uh, working with different groups of, of kids, particularly with... Uh, kids that survived the uh, the genocide at Srebrenica. Um, and from that, that gave me this sort of sense, I think, of two things. One, uh, how fragile communities are and how quickly they can turn against each other. If you'd have travelled in the former Yugoslavia uh, in the early 90s or certainly in the 80s, uh, you wouldn't have got any sense of, of what could come down the line incredibly quickly. Uh, but then also, secondly, both the possibility and the importance and the responsibility of the international community and indeed national institutions to safeguard societies against that sort of, things uh, that sort of thing happening. And when that doesn't happen, when those safeguards aren't there, where you don't uh, provide that scaffolding, how quickly things can degenerate. So from that, I went on to, uh, to work for Oxfam and for Save the Children and with Gemma at uh, Crisis Action and actually with Nick and Randy and, uh, and several others, um, to really look at um, how communities respond to um, uh, particularly sort of ethnic and religious hatred and how you, uh, how you safeguard communities and civilians from the violence that can erupt. 
So that was the starting point. And I think all, always in my head, my assumption was that this was externally directed, that our sort of liberal audit order, with a small l, um, in the UK and Europe was broadly safe. And actually, it was better to spend more of my time internationally. Uh, for, for both me and, uh, and for my wife, we started worrying about that probably sort of two or three years ago, a sense that actually some of the, um, some of the assumptions that we had about uh, how uh, safe our societies were, were in fact being threatened by uh, the rise of what we call populism, but which is in fact bigotry and, and hatred. Um, so that's, that's where my, my thinking was going. And then Tim and I, uh, in, in, the, in that moment of the refugee crisis, just felt we had to, uh, to dedicate our, our time to that. And then obviously, as, as many of you know, um, for me, that then, um, uh, that then became very personal with, with the murder of my wife. Um, sorry. And, and from that, um, a sense, I think, of two things. One, uh, that, um, that what, what's happened in other societies, there's no reason that doesn't happen in your own society. And then secondly, um, also, the, the sort of more hopeful element out of that was actually the, the response. The, so the public response in the UK to what happened was huge, and it was overwhelming, and it was beautiful. And so that sense of um, that there is a, an equal and opposite reaction to the hatred that is there, which we have both an obligation and a responsibility to tap into. And I think um, what we've all realised, um, I've been out in uh, California, in Silicon Valley, and there is nowhere better to understand the force of change that is uh, erupting upon us. And um, the, the nature of this, of this forum is around fault lines, um, and we are seeing them come to the surface. And um, communities are uh, absorbing shock at a, a greater rate than ever before and it's only going to get faster and it's only going to get greater so um, it's really imperative that we look at this seriously and urgently um, and our quest together is to try and bring the best possible people together to um, find the most effective solutions and we're grateful to you for being a small part of that today. Um, we're going to start by um, sharing some of the research with you because I think that gives you a really good grounding um, to be able to start thinking through um, what some of those best solutions might be. <coughs> Tim, over to you. Great. So <coughs> over the past uh, 18 months, um, uh, we've been involved in a bunch of research, partly research that we've commissioned, partly that we've advised, partly bringing together others' research, about a million dollars worth uh, the past 18 months. Pew, uh, Tent Foundation, Ipsos Mori, IFOP, um, uh, IRC, some of the organisations have been doing it. And I just want to very quickly give you sort of five insights from that, which, uh, as I say, they, as we've been explaining, they began with the refugee crisis, but they've shifted our thinking in terms of what the way forward is when um, this fear uh, overtakes communities. Um, so we've got some research... Uh, really quite groundbreaking reports coming out on Germany and France um, in the next few weeks, uh, which are part of our contribution, but there's a broader approach here that's a form informing the, um, the, what we believe is a solution. So let me take you through five insights from this research. The first is that even though constantly we hear in the media, um, whichever country we're in, obviously there's a, there's a strange moment right now where the politics of the United States and the politics of most European countries are remarkably similar. Um, you've got the sort of angry nationalist element in the United States, of course, the administration, um, but insurgent parties that, you know, many countries in Europe are, are the, the largest single uh, political party right now. You've got them and you've got the other end, the cosmopolitans, the sort of more liberal values that we'll, we'll unpack in a moment. But the important thing is that even though we're constantly hearing those two sides as, as if the, our countries are 50-50 or 52-48, our research is very strongly showing us consistently that about half the population doesn't see itself as belonging to either of those groups. We broadly call them the, the anxious middle. And here's um, a picture of them in the, the UK, research done by an organisation <laughs> called Hope Not Hate, one of our partners, where they talk about two anxious middle groups, the culturally concerned and the immigration ambivalence, just below 50%. Um, if we look at... Um, and if we look at the, um, who these, these groups are, these anxious middle groups, um, the insights that you get is 
Number one, they're different. They're, they are, there's quite different qualities among those middle groups. There isn't a single anxious middle. Secondly, they're really different between different countries. I'll show you an example in France and Germany in a moment. Um, but they're, they're essentially less ideological. They're less they're engaged in issues. They're busy with their own lives and their families. Uh, they often hold mutually con contradictory views. Um, and, you know, researchers can get frustrated. How can you believe this and also believe that? But they're People and many of us on issues that we don't think about constantly do hold contradictory uh, views. Um, the views are more shaped by emotion than reason. Um, uh, some of those groups are more open to persuasion than others, typically the younger um, age profile, but not always. Um, and because they're different, you need different strategies to reach each of those segments. Um, so those are broad uh, insights. If we look at France, You've got the, um, the sympathetic multiculturals um, who comprise 30%. The angry pessimists, a really, really angry group in the case of France. And then three groups in the middle. The abandoned and opposed are quite close to the angry pessimists but have a lot more sort of don't know, don't care um, in their attitude. Uh, there's a middle group of immigration sceptics who are inclined against immigration um, uh, uh, and, a, and a group of calm moderates, a kind of old left group um, in France, which has traditionally had a strong sort of left socialist group. Um, and, and they are that group there in the middle is, is half the population. The distinctive thing about France is there is a clear lean, a clear uh, hostile towards outsiders lean across you know, three of those five groups. In the case of Germany, it's different. The, um, the, the difference is that the, uh, the lean among the majority, I mean, three out of those five groups is clearly pro-integration, pro, uh, you know, more, more open uh, values. Um, so we have liberal cosmopolitans and radical opponents, but we have something that's very German, which is the economic pragmatists who genuinely look at immigration in a very rational way. They know about replacement ratios in their population, which as a former economic advisor to a prime minister is really exciting. I never knew I'd come across a country where people actually knew about the replacement ratios. Uh, but genuinely, they see immigration through that lens and are relatively positive towards it. A group of humanitarian sceptics who are um, an older population that essentially both believe in the, the, that it's good to have outsiders coming in and particularly that they should have a responsibility to refugees, but have saying some scepticism about whether that's going to work and whether integration will work, but they lean positive. And then a group of more moderate opponents. Um, so different to France, and in a broader sense, you know, France gives us one, one end of a spectrum of countries and Germany gives us the opposite end. We find Germany, Sweden, Spain, Portugal, the other Scandinavian countries at one end of the spectrum, France, Central and Eastern European countries at the other. Um, so those are some broader insights from that, the, the um, anxious middle segments. Third insight, populate, the populists are succeeding because the middle groups feel that the populists hear their concerns, their anxieties about change in a way that the other side, the sort of more liberal, more cosmopolitan end, doesn't. There's three anxieties that populists are always speaking to. The first anxiety is that my country is disappearing, France is disappearing, America is disappearing. The sense of a loss of traditional culture and values. The second is fear about security, terrorism and, and crime and obviously a, a sense this outside group that's coming in is a threat to us. And the third is around living standards, which in the case of France, for example, is jobs because of the high unemployment rate. In the case of uh, Britain, it's more about the NHS, and pressures on the hospital system and housing and so forth. It translates differently from one country to the other. But essentially, you've got culture, security and economy as the three concerns where there's genuine anxiety in those middle groups and the populists are often speaking to those anxieties more effectively than the others. But it's worth noting that the, those, the anxious middle groups, almost all of them are supportive of the idea that they have a responsibility to welcome refugees. So they have anxieties, but they also have compassion. And that's what puts, puts them in the middle. They're not at one, one end of the spectrum. So our question is about how we reach those people. A fourth really key insight is that what's driving attitudes towards the other, whatever the other is in your society, is much less an issue, an understanding of a specific issue, an immigration policy or refugee policy. It's much more something visceral, which is how you view otherness. If you have a, an opposition to otherness, then that's going to run across a, a, a number of different issues and people. Um, and so 
the way you move forward on this is not just to sort of have a debate about refugee policy, it's to understand the fear of the other and how do we overcome that. And this is the big journey for us in realising that it's not running refugee campaigns that will move us forward, it's actually dealing with the more fundamental sense of disconnectedness and fear of the other and sense of loss of belonging and identity that is driving these concerns. Last insight is that our cosmopolitans, who, who most of us would, be, would belong to that group, urban, more highly educated, professional, more confident, more optimistic, that group is the largest group in most countries. Um, it holds these values of openness, diversity, inclusion really strongly. Um, and they're willing to do a lot in support of those values, to give money, 15% of the population across 12 European countries, 12,000 people recently surveyed said they would host a refugee in their own home. So they're really committed to these values, but they are their own worst enemies because the way that they talk to the rest of the population sounds like they're talking down, sounds like they think others are racists or they're dumb or they're prejudiced. And the rest of the population hears the way they speak in a really different way to the way that the cosmopolitans intend but they're still important because they're most ready to do stuff. So those are five key insights from our research. Where that um, takes us to is the hypothesis that to reach the anxious middle, the decisive groups that are gonna shape whether or not the populace succeed, whether or not our societies do embrace hate or whether we reject the, the threat. It comes down to building a new narrative that reaches the anxious middle. And also really importantly, giving them Ex new experiences that connect them to each other and that connect them in a way that, they, that we build closer communities but also more inclusive communities. Not just closer with people all like us but closer with people who, who are different and diverse. Knowing that it's, it's about where we move this narrative forward, where we move people's perspective forward is around an understanding of who we are together. So that's, that's the sort of the, 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 the large insight that's come out of the research that we've been doing and then the question for us now is how we turn that into a practical plan. So um, alongside that uh, opinion research um, uh, uh, there was another piece of research that we did at the same time which was essentially twofold um, which was diving into the politics of what was driving otherness and then also uh, trying to understand the civil society architecture, what was there at the moment to be able to respond to it. So to cut a very long story short, uh, about a, year, a, a year's worth of story, um, there were five conclusions in terms of areas that we think we needed to focus in order to deliver those two strands of work that um, Tim was just talking about, one being narrative and the other being experience. So the first was to continue doing the work that we've already started on the opinion uh, research and the message testing. In some countries, there's already good data, uh, like the UK. In other countries, France and Germany, for example, there are just huge chasms uh, of data. So filling that gap is really important, and not just filling the gap, but then propagating the insights from it. Secondly, working in particular with um, uh, political parties, centre-left, centre-right. Uh, we're working with Macron in France at the moment. We've been working with the CDU, the Conservatives in the UK, um, to help them understand how you avoid falling into the trap that Tim was talking about, about the um, constantly placating uh, the populace and ending up where you're reinforcing their frames and strengthening them uh, as a movement. The interesting thing from that, both Tim and I uh, have political backgrounds, uh, the interesting thing from that was uh, not that those political parties are broadly clueless, I think we had uh, assumed that, but they realise that they're clueless and they're really thirsty uh, to engage and for the, for the data and analysis that we have. Third piece is about how do we um, uh, build out uh, creative coalitions in order to reach those anxious middle audiences. Just as one example of this, uh, we partnered with Airbnb um, in the run-up to Thanksgiving in the US uh, last year. And what we did there is we went out, particularly in Trump-supporting demographics, and asked uh, their host population, the Airbnb hosts, if they would invite a new American family for tea, uh, sorry, for Thanksgiving. So this wasn't invite a Muslim to your house, it was invite a new American family for Thanksgiving. And that frame and that experience, we only did this, this at a pilot stage, but was absolutely transformative in terms of those, uh, those people's attitudes. So that's just a, a, an example of that third. 
The fourth piece is, uh, sorry, I've got those the wrong way around. Um, the, the fourth piece, which is the third piece there, um, just to check you're keeping up, um, is um, about actually uh, on that wider sense of coalition. So not just that so that targets the anxious middle, but also um, how do we both bring together the, the sort of pro-diversity constituency, which is at the moment entirely siloed between different groups. You have your migration constituency, your refugee constituency, your LGBT constituency, your women's group, move, uh, women's movement. Whereas on the other side, the sort of uh, the populist right, you have this broad integrated movement about intolerance uh, and we have to strengthen uh, the links between those communities and start to popularise a common narrative. Similarly to that, there's huge, powerful cultural institutions from football clubs to faith movements, trade unions to big uh, businesses, who are already your allies on this stuff. The issue is, is that they feel politically exposed if they engage too much in this. And secondly, they also feel um, uh, that, that you know, they don't want to hold the strategy, that it's not, it's not their day job. If you're Arsenal Football Club, for example, otherness isn't the main thing you think about, although you're very supportive of, of the agenda in reducing it. So we think that by giving them strength in numbers, safety in numbers, we can get those organisations to become more vocal. Fifthly and finally, uh, and critically, is alongside that narrative, actually how do we work at a much more grassroots uh, level to engage communities, to bring communities closer together. Um, and just as an example of this, I mean, this sort of cuts across, but one of the things that we're doing at, uh, in the moment in the UK is called the Great Get Together. And the very basic proposition of that, the very simple idea behind it, is to ask communities to come together, to share food with their neighbours and celebrate what we have in common. Um, now, we, we put this together for the 17th and 18th of June. Um, and the scale of this, I mean, I won't go into all, uh, the, the detail of it, but we expect about 10 million people to take part in the UK that weekend. So about one in six of the UK population. Um, we've got uh, everybody from the BBC through to the Sun newspaper um, uh, involved in backing it. We've got everybody from the Premier League through to the Women's Institute. So an incredibly broad swathe, and that's partly because of the connection to Joe. But actually, it's, it's something more fundamental. In, in, I met with um, uh, the editor of The Sun last week. And the reason that they're so... And The, and the Sun, for those of you who aren't UK, is a sort of right-wing tabloid uh, newspaper. Not necessarily a friend of these uh, messages. But the reason they're so interested and engaged is not out of the kindness of their heart, but it tallies with an instinct within their audience from their, from their market testing, which is that they feel that they want to do more on, the, on their community. They want a better sense of togetherness a stronger and more positive sense of national identity. So the reason they're jumping in behind it is because that's where their people are. And that's, I think, one of the reasons for optimism. So what we're going to do from here is to just pause before we, we have a group challenge, the work that we've got to do. But we just wanted to pause and uh, check if there's any questions that are sort of burning on people's minds from all of that. I know that we've just sort of downloaded lots of information. So. Hi, my name is Roshan Paul. I uh, run an education organization in Nairobi and, and Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, two questions. One is, did you map it also according to urban and rural? Because that seemed to have been a big divide as well in both the US and the UK elections. And then secondly, it looks like you're, you're only looking at it in terms of Europe and the US. And um, I think that this is a much bigger problem than that. And the UK is relatively small at the end of the day compared to countries like the Philippines and India and so on that have all gone towards much, you know, quite dangerous populist leaders. And so um, how are you thinking about looking beyond the West as well? Mm. I'll just quickly answer that one. So um, the urban-rural or the sort of city-regional divide comes out really strongly in the segmentation. So yes. Um, uh, on the second question about regions, yeah, I mean, I, we, we are focused on the developed countries. Um, that's been our starting point. And I think we, we want to um, test things in sort of, you know, certain controlled markets and not sort of take on the world, <laughs> I think as if we're not ready. But, yeah. but we actually, I mean, yeah, a number of conversations we've had are exactly what you're saying. I mean, you're looking at common drivers yeah. in societies across the board. It doesn't need to be a, a rich, developed country. Yeah. And one of, the, I think one of the, you know, the, <coughs> it, when we get to the work, the input that you're all going to give us, examples from anywhere are useful because there is enough that is universal in this, whereby, frankly, the West has a lot to learn from elsewhere. 
And I think just going back to the uh, explanations of personal motivation, all of us are people who've worked internationally a great deal. And this really feels like a moment where, honestly, like, we need to come back home <laughs> and look what's, you know, look what's under the bonnet of our own countries and what's going on. And that's, for us, the personal motivation of it. It's not that it's not happening elsewhere. It's that we feel a particular responsibility. Um, and absolutely, that we're very open to collaboration from anyone we can learn with and, you know, what it goes from there. Thank you, Dixon Osborne with the Center for Justice and Accountability in San Francisco. So you talked about the need to develop a new narrative, so message, but you didn't talk about messenger, except to the extent you're talking about pulling together uh, the NGOs and the communities in England for the great get together, which sounds like the cosmopolitan community, which is the community that is not being listened to. So I'm curious if you did any research on credible messengers for it. And second question is, is there a difference in message uh, long-term versus in crisis. It seems to me that in crisis, people revert to instinct, which may not be where we want them to be. So I'm curious about sort of the breakthrough in these crisis moments. We'll we maybe take a couple more questions and then, yeah. Um, hi, Derek Brown with the Peace Appeal Foundation. Building on that, I just wonder what the social psychology research you've looked at about mind changes. I'm, I'm reminded of Herb Kalman who had sort of three stages and people once they're, seems a lot of your work is premised on people getting a relationship short term with one another, which gets people to sort of align their values, but that's, that doesn't have transformative change. So I'm wondering what other research you might be citing. Hello, Federico from Porticus in Latin America. Um, I was surprised that you didn't mention much about um, social media post-truth and that kind of phenomenon that we've all heard about. Um, so if there's anything that you need to share with us, because it's probably gonna come up uh, in the discussion table. So if you've looked at that, I'd like to just understand where that fits. Okay. Um, so credible messengers, uh, spot on. Um, yeah, the, the answer is the most credible people are people like me. Uh, not, not people like me, but <laughs> people like me. <laughs> in, uh, for, so, uh, yeah, not NGO people, not politicians, uh, uh, not even celebrities. I mean, there's some interesting research that we've recently done, the great get-together, that's really showing that. So, yeah, uh, we've actually, t you know, tested some small things um, that are, are evidence of that as well. Um, so... It's, it actually means a much more social media driven approach actually because it's an authenticity and much less polish. So the, the organisation that I've worked in the last few years, um, uh, Purpose, which is a sort of a creative agency movement builder, you know, what it was doing five years ago was creating expensive flashy videos. Now where it shifted is creating you know, really kind of low rent crappy videos, but lots of them that are those autoplays on Facebook. And they're the things that get massive reach because they feel more kind of raw and authentic and, and much less sort of, you know, Hollywood. So that's an example of, of how that's shifting. Um, your, your second question? Was also crisis versus the crisis moment. Message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think there is, there, there certainly is a, there's certainly a difference in those, in those messages. It's not something we've tested. Um, so I think, and, and I think similarly, um, you know, th there's a, our next stage of research is, is two things. One is, I think, going in, in more detail on the, on the messages, uh, so messages and messengers. So we've got a good sense from this early research about what messages work with people in terms of their own perception of whether they work with them. So i.e. if you hear this message, are you more likely to be sympathetic or less likely to be sympathetic? Obviously, that's, only, that's of limited utility because what it doesn't, doesn't get to is actually whether it is working in changing people's minds. I think one of the things that we're interested in, um, uh, both with uh, that sort of messaging exercise, but also with the broader sort of academic theory of change in terms of uh, particularly uh, contact theory, is going quite hard quite early into very specific locations, um, engaging and investing in them at scale, and being able to show that as proof of concept. Because I think in order to get, I think to, to your point, in order to get the change of attitudes, 
there needs to be a level of uh, substantive engagement over time that you're not going to be able to do at scale right from the beginning without large scale public private partnerships or uh, governmental governmental backing. So I think one of the things we're going to try to do early is actually to road test this in individual communities. Did you want to take on any of the other questions? Yeah, I mean, just, just one thing to add on to that, which I think is going to be finding the right community partners is going to be key to this. And that's something that, like, I know a lot of people in the Skull community have done in many countries across the world. Um, it's really going to be the combination between the sophisticated strategic communications and then deep, deep grassroots work. Um, and, um, yeah, obviously broadening the constituency out <laughs> beyond, beyond us lot, right? Like that's going to be the place that we start. Um, okay, why don't we, yeah, move on. Uh, just want sh short term, long term. I think that a key priority for us is to find short term encounter that produces long term engagement. So, I mean, I think that's the sort of big question. But, we're s we're s you know, while um, a 10 million people having lunch together, um, you know, is great, uh, I think the question for us is building, making that transformative in a, in a long-term sense. Um, okay, do we want to, um, are there any more, que is any more, one, one more question before we jump into our exercise? No? All good? Uh, one more. Sorry, have you done any research about how it maps across other issues like um, perceptions around um, action on climate change or women's reproductive rights or any of the other issues that are in the front line of the populists, not just... Um, integration. Yeah, I mean, I think a broad observation is that um, views on the other cluster together very, very strongly. We have done much more limited testing of whether those, how strongly those views cluster to views on climate, views on reproductive rights, etc. Um, I think in I think the US research that we do will be, will be really interesting on that. I mean, the US is much more uh, now a country, I mean, it's almost sort of Sunni Shia, isn't it, the divide of Republican Democrat, in the sense that you, you sign up to a whole set of values. Um, and I don't think that's nearly as true in other countries. I think there's more diversity, but I think that's, yeah, we're, we're, we're really interested sort of to, to understand and map that more, more clearly, particularly with the US research. Okay, we have a, um, a challenge that we now want to uh, uh, put to you, um, and this is where the, 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 the hard work. Um, you've got a sense of where we're going with this uh, exercise, which is to um, come up with initiatives that can connect people um, and build uh, closer and more inclusive communities. Uh, one of our insights in doing that is that the most powerful ways of connecting people may not be when you get them together in a room and saying, we're now going to connect you diverse people. It's more that in the process of doing something which the people in that room value, or the people on that football field or whatever value, that they will build connection with each other and overcome a distrust of the stranger. Um, critical insights about this is it's most important to do it among not the people who are already there, right? the cosmopolitans, um, the, the ones who are already, you know, more sort of committed to community values. Um, so it's a broader piece than that. Um, an example of how we imagine this working um, is uh, the Olympic volunteering um, that London had in 2012. Um, and apologies that we're a little bit UK specific in our, in our examples. But that's an example where communities, really diverse communities, people came together and the common endeavour, uh, I saw the same thing 12 years before in Sydney actually, so the common endeavour of people working together, uh, strangers um, and very different people um, became one of the most powerful experiences of their life. And for years people uh, uh, after that talk about that experience, that sense of why can't, can't we be like that every day? Um, Brendan mentioned the example of the Airbnb's Supper With Us, but a specific illustration of this, an 82-year-old Trump voter from Florida goes to his, um, his son's uh, Thanksgiving dinner where he's inviting uh, Abdul, who's an Afghan Mus um, Muslim uh, refugee into the US. Trump voter, against immigration, worried about Muslims, etc. By the end of the night, he's so taken with Abdul that he goes back to his retirement village in, in um, Florida and writes in his weekly newsletter that he writes about how Abdul is more American 
than most Americans he knows. That Abdul loves the Constitution, knows what our, <coughs> our founding fathers, excuse me, actually believe in. And because he was a translator for the US Army, he's got this amazing story of how he got it. And by the end of that night, his prejudice about Muslims were largely dissolved through that individual encounter that he was then talking about, not just Abdul, the individual, but also talking about the Muslims. And that's one insight that encounter in the right contexts can be quite transformational um, for people in overcoming uh, prejudice. Um, so that's a, a couple of insights. Here's our challenge. Um, we're asking you to brainstorm specific initiatives like those two, um, which could be used to bring people together, to build more connected and more inclusive communities, um, especially among people maybe who aren't necessarily all like us, um, bringing different groups together, so not just bringing a community of similar people together, but different people, um, and not necessarily with the entry point being where, you know, celebrating diversity. Um, that's our challenge uh, for us to spend a few minutes um, around the tables together. Now, uh, we wanted to check is if we could be really um, uh, high tech with this and do this on a big Google Doc. But I wanted to work out whether does how many tables does somebody uh, at how many tables does somebody have a laptop or something else that will work Google Apps on this? Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. yeah. I think we can make that work and maybe, if not, you could join a table that does. So Johnny over here is just going to run around and grab the email addresses and all done. All done. Great. Fantastic. Wow. So uh, we're going to share this or maybe Johnny's already shared this document <laughs> and, <laughs> and that way we can do this uh, as a sort of collaboration together. Um, and then we'll run through it in, um, uh, in just over 15 minutes. We'll come back together. So let's see if we can uh, come up with stuff. Any questions about the exercise before we jump in? Just to say, these can be initiatives that do exist or don't yet exist. You don't have to be confined to what exists already in the real world. Yep. Yeah. It can be some things that you just think would be a great idea, but you don't think it exists yet. Yeah. And it might be somewhere where people already are coming together, um, but it's not being, there's, there's much more that can be done to make that coming together into stronger connection. Yeah. Great, thanks. Doc, is that uh, we're not just going to steal all your ideas and take them off into the darkness. You get to see each other's, and um, if you would like them, you can take them away with you. Um, so what we thought we'd do is, um, what we thought we'd do is just hear two of your most brilliant insights from each table. Um, and then, uh, if as you're uh, going around, what somebody says prompts an even better one or equally good one from you, put it in the Google Doc. Um, so that would be really good to keep that dynamic. Um, and uh, if, if anyone wants to make sure that we send you that doc or you want us to keep you in touch with the deck or further research, also just put your um, email address in, in that doc and we'll make sure that we share with you um, what we're doing. Um, so let's start uh, here. Um, two, two insights that you'd like to show us. Microphone is coming, thank you very much. Well waited for the microphone. <laughs> um, two ideas, uh, one football, um, that you, um, lo local football teams, say Arsenal hosts the tournament um, and you'll get to go, and, the incentive is you'll get to go and play on um, the Emirates Stadium, but it's local football teams that are coming in um, from around the area to play together and you might get time with the footballers, say you might have one of the first 11 players on your team um, and then you'll have a chat or a barbecue or something afterwards. Um, the second one is around sort of, sort of a hackathon about fixing your local community. So you get, say, your lo local high street's a bit rubbish. How do, you, how do you fix it? You bring people together um, to kind of work out what the design is, what needs to be fixing, and you kind of, then it's who's going to do what, who's got the skills, no matter who you are, who's got the skills to do it. And then you have a big celebration at the end um, with bunting. <laughs> <laughs> Does everyone know what bunting is? <laughs> Don't know, ask Nick. Uh, thank you very, very much. Excellent. Uh, onwards. Hello. Uh, a few uh, interesting ideas came up on this table. Um, food, obviously, is a big one. Di various different ways uh, of bringing together uh, groups through food. Uh, one of the ideas that I liked that came uh, was where you could do, um, instead of choosing uh, a type or, an, or, or a, a, a 
uh, food from a particular part of the world or where you interact with people from that world, you could have an opportunity to taste food blindly, if you like. And based on the type of food that you think is the most uh, interesting or that you, that you like the most, then you will get to go to that person's home and, mm. and meet with them directly and eat the food. So you don't have any kind of bias. You're just blindly tasting. And then, then it sort of opens new doors. So I thought that was a really interesting idea. Um, music is another big one that we think connects people, but not sort of the current big, large music events where people just go with their friends and, and don't speak to anybody. It's, I think what we're talking about is more intimate, uh, closer uh, venues for, for music uh, where there is a real opportunity for people to connect and interact with each other. And then the last one was uh, theatre, which is also a really interesting way. Uh, and again, um, getting, uh, finding opportunities to bring uh, groups together through theatre. And instead of people telling their own stories uh, when they're kind of passing on a message, act, actually asking people to act or uh, present somebody else's story. So they're putting themselves into the shoes of others by, by, through theatre and acting. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Really um, lovely. Um, so we think about the idea of, like, we thought back at the Olympics where we had so the refugee team that would go and like, represent um, a community group of people and, and that's great and that's a scale that's very big but bringing that back to sort of uh, local community so have sort of touring refugee teams or sports and things like that to come into like local communities and play matches against like the local teams that are like, football outside in Oxford or things like that to so try and build that relationship with these individuals in, in this like smaller scales. Yeah great thank you. Um, so we, similar to the hackathon idea, we, I've been working with Grant Thornton recently who've done a series of what they call live labs where mm. they have two to three thousand people who will come together to, from all across the community to solve an issue. So they did healthcare in Manchester recently mm -hmm. and we just liked it as a way of turning it around to the communities to yeah. own the solutions and then hopefully help to drive them. Um, and obviously not focused on healthcare, but could you do something at a city-wide level that is about how do we build a community? And then it led on to a conversation around, and could there almost be a competitive element? So kind of this is what Manchester's oh, doing to build nice. the best community. This is what Edinburgh's doing to build the best community and yeah. um, have a bit of fun with it that way. Excellent. We should, it'd be lovely to learn more about um, that uh, project, actually. It'd be great. Yeah. Um, here? Is there something? The two of you? Yeah? Hi, we were a massive table and team of two. <laughs> um, building on your sort of community fix-it type idea, we, we wondered what a sort of free task rabbit type <laughs> offer would look like. So, you know, it could be uh, you offered filling in tax returns for people and someone else might offer gardening or what have you, and that yeah. felt like something that, that could be enduring. Um, a related idea to that was um, eBay for people. So what if you could kind of swap yourself for a weekend um, I, I say, more, say more about that. I've got no idea. It's, it, it's the beginning of it's a. It's your fantasy. Kind of <laughs> no, no, I'm quite comfortable fantastic. with who I am. No, 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 but, um, yeah. uh, so, I don't know. We just wonder what eBay for people uh, might yeah, look nice. like. Um, and then a thought, um, and I saw it popping up elsewhere uh, that, that you talked about, just the whole vehicle of. Um, actually, where you do have a school in a cosmopolitan area that has a cosmopolitan school, actually kids being the vehicle for connecting mm. communities in a way that adults struggle with, yes. and, and actually just yeah, was, was yeah. is there a way of somehow taking that energy and that convening power? Although we also noted that often, you know, I, I live in rural Suffolk, um, and you know what, you know, I, I, I can't find anyone from yeah. any other you know, diverse background at all within yeah. you know, 50 miles of where I live. It just I know that, exist. that's one of the challenges is, is how you connect across communities, not just within. No, th and, and that's the thing. I live in a very diverse area of Amsterdam. Yeah. And my, my five-year-old goes to school and it's amazing. I see so much more than I did before, you know, she was born and she was in my life. Yeah. And she connects with everyone and I connect through her and it's so easy yeah. to do that. I think, and, and they organize, you know, schools, school yeah. parties, and all parents come. It's not intentional to whatever, you know, to celebrate diversity or anything, yeah. but it just happens, and the connections are being made through the kids, and it's really powerful. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, you've mentioned research yeah. about that, where it's like some of the most potent moments yes. to connect to very young yeah, children. Yeah, because you share also, you want, everyone wants their kids to do well in school, and, and they right. want to help, you know, so... Yeah. Uh, 
some mothers bake pancakes, fathers do this, and you get together and, and yeah. really get to know uh, others. It's yeah. very powerful. Also, traveling, we mentioned, is a powerful tool. You know, I took my husband, who was very much, you know, sort of anti-Moroccan. I took him to Morocco for three weeks. I said, we're going to Morocco on holiday. And he said, really? And I said, after three weeks, he never, ever said anything about those Moroccans anymore, you know? So just opening, and it's maybe a bit expensive, but, you know, at least <laughs> Morocco is not that far away. Why do people go to Spain? Why not, you know, travel like half an hour further and then you're in a really different, you know, environment? Why yeah. not, you know? Yeah. So maybe we can, you can accommodate some of those travels. Okay, brilliant. This is all yeah. excellent stuff. Moving on here to the d table, table down here, yeah. I think we just picked up on a lot of the other things that's been said. So there's definitely the kids. We, we talked about sports teams and kids. I think an interesting point that came up was um, around sharing the stories where reconciliation does happen and how do you craft the right strategic story tell how it's mediated, and then how do you distribute it? Um, we had other ideas, but we've got yeah. them all in due course. Okay, excellent. Okay, yes, table behind you. Is it me? I'm, I'm not reflecting the gender balance on our table. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we also talked about a couple of things, um, starting with the sports events, and then settled for the sort of education institution schools and uh, using schools uh, and and I think here's the, the perfect word for school parties. School parties across town uh, where schools actually have, uh, you know, a diverse uh, catchment area and uh, through the kids you can then bring in the parents. Um, it's not more refined than that, but basically go through safe places, um, but taking the party out of the schoolyard so that it's a little bit out of the comfort zone, we, we felt. Um, there's an element of if you stay within your comfort zone, you, you may reinforce your own thinking and your own beliefs and values. So uh, taking your school party away from the campus, but using the same uh, sort of uh, stakeholders, parents. Mm, thank you. And, and on, just to build on that, we were talking about how we could be more aspirational, essentially, because if we look at how much our society has changed in 100 yeah. years, how little we use our bodies, how much we're in our minds, how much information is always kind of coming at us and how we have to sift through it and how we're on our devices day in, day out, not just adults, but also children, and how insular and isolated we're becoming. Yeah. So then, in order to kind of counterbalance that, what if we were deliberate about the values we want to uphold and again schools are doing this institutions are trying to do this but if families were to do it and say actually what if we stood for celebration nature being out in the outdoors what if we stood for that every day then what a different life we'd make just instantly in making that decision yeah thank you um and last but not least the grand crescendo <laughs> no pressure <laughs> yeah no pressure <laughs> Um, so my name's Josh. As the dude who had the laptop, I was strong-armed <laughs> into doing this. Um, we talked a lot about uh, food, we talked about sport, uh, we talked about theatre, some of the things that have been covered. Uh, but in terms of stuff that was slightly um, different, uh, one thing that Hannah mentioned um, was uh, using uh, the scalability um, of the school system. Um, so go in and uh, foster um, greater understanding about how um, our societies are becoming more diverse, but also about how pre, um, you know, recent immigration, our societies were diverse yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, and then another theme that came up was um, about how we can harness um, the kind of interaction that is a commercial transaction for the purposes of uh, fostering like mutual understanding. So to use an example from my own work, I run a phone repair social enterprise mm -hmm. that trains and employs gang members and young offenders to yeah. um, fix smash phones. They go into uh, large corporates and repair phones for, uh, you know, fat cats, bankers, whatever, that they don't have a great opinion of. And over the course of the half an hour repair, they get to learn quite a lot about that individual. They get to learn about what the workplace is like. And equally, that banker learns about the background of the young person that we're right. working with. Um, and it's a very uh, kind of, uh, it doesn't feel awkward. You haven't got to spend ages trying to get people there. There are incentives already built into the transaction. Exactly. They're making yeah. money. And yeah. I think that's how, what you mentioned, Tim, how a very um, kind of short, um, sharp intervention, in our case, training up someone to fix a phone, um, can lead to kind of longer term sustainable interactions, which is them going, 
off their backs and repairing uh, phones in their own time. So yeah. something um, to the tune of that um, could be uh, interesting, harnessing commercial transactions. Yeah, I think I, uh, so much so. I think, I think that's very true that what we're looking for is um, opportunities where there are natural incentives, where you're not trying to get people to do something out of the goodness of their heart, but going to where people want and need something you know, practical. So it would be fantastic to hear more about what you're doing as well. Um, so, I mean, we, we've run out of time. I think, I mean, I already feel better from hearing it. I've got all these wonderful <laughs> images of all these events that are going to uh, take place. I mean, it's amazing how even just thinking about this stuff has an uh, impact, right? So um, we know that we can't do this alone. The scale of what needs to happen is really, really big. And it's only going to happen if actually it's, a, it's mapping an ecosystem of people working together and supporting each other and reinforcing a lot of amazing work that's happening already and, and joining the dots, as we've already heard from many of the interventions today. So just to reiterate, if there's um, people that you know that you think we should be supporting or working with, um, research that you think we be, should be looking into, um, anything that you think we're getting wrong that we need to correct. Like, um, we're really, really open to all suggestions at the moment and are, are genuinely very grateful for um, the contribution that you've um, given us today. So th thank you very, very much. It's not often you get an opportunity to ask great people like you something like that. So thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>